Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Larry Peng, the head of business development and founding member of IOTEX. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Great to be here, Monica. Uh, share a little bit about what we're doing here at IOTEX and just give some broader views about the crypto ecosystem. I love that. I love that. It's weird to, I mean, I was kind of confused when I even saw you come into my inbox because I was like, wait, IoT and blockchain, that doesn't happen a lot. It, it hasn't mm-hmm. really caught on. It's not like we're having smart watches that are enabled by blockchain just yet. Yeah. Um, but when I heard that you really had devices, it was it's such an interesting kind of intersection that frankly, was only confusing at first. I'm glad you kind of explained it to me before we got on this and started recording. But I think anybody who sees IOTEX, like IOT and blockchain, they would be just as confused. Can you talk a little bit about the two main products that you have and how really just the blockchain component makes them so different? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so IOTEX at the core of what it is, is a layer one blockchain, um, EVM compatible, cheaper, faster, more decentralized than Ethereum, like all other layer one blockchains today. Um, for now. Uh, But what really differentiates IOTEX from the other layer ones out there is we have a really big focus on adding IoT oriented middleware and kind of these sub protocols to allow devices to have identities, to have devices able to stream data directly to smart contracts, and for devices to benefit from this kind of ultra security that blockchain provides, right? So um, we have two devices uh, live on the network right now. One is called UCAM. UCAM is a home security camera that's been on sale on Amazon since September of 2020, about uh, 8,000 units globally across 60 plus countries. And it's a own your data camera. It uses decentralized identity as a login mechanism, removing the email password traditionally. Um, And basically we take the user's private key that they only they own, right? Only they have access to, uh, and we use it to -to end-to-end encrypt all the videos. Um, So they are the only ones that have the key uh, have the decryption key so that only they can view their videos and they have authorization controls and things like this, right? So it's really the first use case of blockchain as an identity layer for the camera. Uh, but the, we also have other devices that, you know, do a little bit more than just provide ownership, right? Uh, this is called Pebble Tracker. This is our new device um, coming out very soon, uh, shipping by the end of this month. Wow. And this is an asset tracker. It does, it reads data like GPS, temperature, humidity, air quality, air pressure, motion, vibration, light, right? Basically gives you a full 360 view of whatever asset this is meant to be tracking, whether it's a person, a dog, a vehicle, a container, uh, a truck, right? Uh, It just provides uh, unbiased 360 view of what is going on with this asset, right? And more importantly, it signs this data as it's being captured. So you know that it's authentic and it makes it so that whoever owns this device also owns that data. So that's the ownership aspect again, just like you can, right? But this device is really allowing people to grab data from the real world, plug it into smart contracts and generate responses off of it, right? So I'm sure we'll dive down uh, a lot into the use cases that you know, these devices can enable, but at the core of what we're doing, you know, we're just bringing Web3 to IoT and we're also bringing IoT to Web3, right? These billions and billions of devices out there generating 80 zettabytes of data, which is one zettabyte is 1 trillion gigabytes by 2025. I don't even know that term. That's a term I didn't even know existed. (laughs) Yeah, you got to break that one down a little bit. But, you know, there's such a huge opportunity between um, the devices that we interact with every day and this blockchain infrastructure that's really budding. So until this point, IoT and blockchain has been pretty nascent, but I think IoTex is really driving a lot of innovation in the space. So happy to dive into all the different opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Can you just tell me, I guess, uh, let's start with the video camera for a second. Mm-hmm. Or the, the video holder is a camera, but as well as just a, a storage device, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this okay. camera, we worked with a company called Tenvis. They're a, a security camera manufacturer since 2005. They've sold millions of cameras to government, to retail, to enterprise in the past. And they actually came to us uh, looking for, um, you know, privacy as the next big feature for the cameras, right? Uh, you go on Amazon today, you filter for Prime, you filter for four stars, you're still going to have 10,000 plus results, right? So in such a saturated market, they felt privacy was going to be a big feature. We worked on this camera together. Um, even back in late 2019 is when we kind of uh, uh, first unveiled the first prototype. And we actually went to CES and won the CES Innovation Award for cybersecurity and personal privacy with this camera in 2020, uh, which was fantastic. a great, yeah, okay. a great so show of confidence tell me, back then. Mm -hmm. Okay, as a user, I say, okay, I want to, I want to own all of the video of everything that happens, surveillance of my house. I'm going to mm -hmm. stick one in my backyard, my front yard. Everybody's going to, you know, my neighbors might hate me, but whatever. I'm that person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put these up, and this is going to. I mean, typically from, you know, my experience with normal video cameras, which are all some of the cheapest ones on Amazon, honestly, like mm -hmm. I don't need much, but yeah. I would have cameras up in my place when I used to run an artist residency in New Mexico, for example, mm -hmm. and there are all these cameras around and I would be able to check in on my phone and see things, everything moved and, you know, catch people doing whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of saved to my phone. And if I wanted to save it like to a place, I could, I could download it and keep it. Otherwise it just sort of like was out there. I never thought about where it was stored or I just, mm -hmm. I only thought about it in terms of my access to it. Mm -hmm. So what would my user experience be if I had put up your cameras instead of the ones I chose on Amazon, yeah. other than being really a lot more um, out of pocket because I'm sure yours are much higher quality. <laughs> Yeah, no, we really focus on the user experience side of things, right? And this is a problem in crypto generally. How do you get people to set up a wallet and experience crypto? Um, yeah. But, you know, we really masked a lot of that in the background, right? Like right when someone opens up the UCAM app, a uh, private key is, uh, account is created for them. All they have to do is back up the key, right? Um, and the difference between a ring camera, for example, and a UCAM, right? It's, it follows the trend of what's going on in Web3 and crypto a lot, right? All these traditional Web2 applications from big tech, uh, they, they manage a central server, right? They own the keys to this server. They have full visibility into everything in this server. And they base their business off of these promises that, hey, we care about your security. We care about your privacy, right? But with cameras like UCAM, uh, you can make claims or make definitive statements that no one can see your videos except you, right? You're never gonna hear that from a big tech company. They're gonna dance around it and make it seem like so. But the truth is, and we've seen this so many times that these servers are vulnerable and it's not really the top, top priority for these companies to invest in protecting your data, right? Of course All of these breaches. And even what's funny is when we went to CES and we won this award for UCAM, this was at a time when all those ring cameras were being hacked around Christmas time. And, oh, yeah. you know, the traditional email password type things, um, some people call it user error, but, you know, this is how people operate, right? Um, uh Having someone talk to your kid through your through your camera, I'm sure is nothing that people uh, had anticipated in their days, right? So those kind of shock factors, those kind of headlines really push people to look towards more private products. Even earlier this year, we saw mass migration from WhatsApp over to Signal, yep. right? But, you know, as people start to think about private finances, private messaging, I think private data, especially for things like your wearables, your healthcare devices, your smart home uh, cameras and locks, all of that needs to be privatized as well, right? So, um, yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey. You know, um, I think the desire for privacy from users is growing, um, but it's not necessarily just a privacy camera. It's all, also an own your data camera, right? A lot of people need to understand that owning something means you have full control of it. If you don't own it, you don't control it, right? Um, so that's really what we have to think about when we think about all these device, devices that we strap onto our bodies and put in our homes and you know, give to our loved ones, like what, what kind of things are going on in the back end, mostly invisible, but this is the opportunity that blockchain provides. It's a better back end that one day can achieve the same user experience and features as traditional products. Okay. So how does this also, I can, I can imagine how video is one thing that we can make sure is privatized in that data. The GPS piece is really new to me. I mean, I think about when I think of GPS, I think, you know, Google says, we'd like to use your location, allow or don't allow. And that's all I really, you know, that's as much of a opt in or opt out as I imagine, but then suddenly I'll see stuff that if I say, don't use my, my location and I type in like, you know, uh, Home Depot, it'll give me stuff from Manhattan when I'm in San Juan, Puerto Rico or I vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it is, 
it's not able to stay up to date necessarily without GPS, maybe like a search uh, query history, but it seems to be haphazard. That's my only um, context for understanding where my data about my location has any applicability and where I would either want to restrict it further or make sure it was consistently given with a certain permission to the right entities. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how your GPS, your second one coming out in a month, um, mm -hmm. your second product is, is sort of addresses GPS and how that data interacts with the blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. So again, this is this is Pebble Tracker, right? Um, I also have another version that's kind of uh, a clear case, right? So this is what it looks like from the, uh, the inside guts perspective, right? Um, a ton of sensors jammed into it. You know, there's a GPS uh, sensor, um, climate sensor that does temperature, humidity, air quality, air pressure, uh, six axis accelerometer gyroscope that does motion and vibration and a light sensor, right? So uh, a lot of this data is just raw data, right? But that's not what we're interested in. We're, we're interested about the insights that this data can tell us, right? right. Uh, you think about what a light sensor can tell us, right? It can tell you whether a package was opened or not, right? You think about what an accelerometer gyroscope can tell us. If something is meant to be moving, you can, it can tell you, okay, this thing is moving because it senses some velocity, senses some acceleration, or if something is not meant to be moving, um, you know, that can identify it too, right? For temperature, for humidity, these are all really important factors when we ship perishables uh, or vaccines or any type of things that are sensitive to climate. And of course, GPS can not only tell you where the location of important assets are, but you can even abstract that to say, you know, this asset is five miles from the destination. You guys can go ahead and continue the workflow, right? So um, oh, right. all of these kind of things, it really depends on the, the use case that you're trying to do, right? Like attaching a pebble tracker to a vehicle uh, is very different than attaching a pebble tracker to a, a dog, right? Where you're trying to control, make sure your dog doesn't leave a certain geofence. Uh, whereas with a vehicle, you could be submitting your GPS data to a contract. Think about like a decentralized Waze app, right? All these people annotating the map, adding value to the map. It's kind of like this play to earn thing uh, a little bit, you know, contributing to a public digital utility. But you can also get rewards right with that, right? But you have to have a verifiable GPS location in order to um, gain these monetary benefits. Otherwise, it's just a honeypot, right? So really the design space that we're creating with this is connecting things that we do in the real world to things related to digital assets and digital reputation, right? Play to earn all these like Axie Infinity style games have told us that people can do things in the digital world to earn digital assets and digital reputation. This is really taking off from a DAO's, DAO perspective, from a gaming perspective. What IOTEX is trying to do is open up that footprint even more so people can do things in the real world and also earn digital assets and digital reputation, right? Um, there, there's a common like uh, thing around proof of blank, right, in crypto. Um, a lot of people understand proof of work and proof of stake, right? These are literally proofs that you're giving to the blockchain. Right. Right. I'm proving to the blockchain I've solved this computationally intensive puzzle so that I can be a Bitcoin block producer. I prove to the Ethereum blockchain I have 32 ETH so I can be a staker or a validator. Right. What other things can we prove to the blockchain? Right. right? So it's sort of like if I could prove that I played Pokemon Go on blockchain steroids, essentially, mm -hmm. and I went to that corner of that room, stood there for three seconds and took a picture yeah. and I can prove that that happened on this and then I will get a reward for that. So in a sense, yeah. it almost could enable more like of an Oracle, like a distributed Oracle perspective on things. I, I, I'm just wondering, is this, is this something that could be used say in a real estate sense? I've had people say, well, how would you make sure that the real estate assets are taken care of? And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. we have like appraisers go or whatever. That's a centralized approach. Why wouldn't you incentivize the crowd to be like, okay, well, let's go to St. Louis kids. We're going to go on a road trip. But also there's like five different, you know, DAOs that I'm involved in that I'm going to go in and do some work on each one. It's going to pay for the trip. And exactly. I can go and yeah. make sure that this, you know, I'll take pictures and validate that this house is in that condition. I can validate this is in that condition. And mm -hmm. I can actually put myself to work and get these rewards for yeah. having just plugged in to where these bounties exist yeah. and use this technology that can verify that I did what I said I would do. Is that sort of how this piece yeah. works together? Yeah, from that perspective, we, we talked to a lot of interesting companies that have pitched us use cases very similar to that, right? What are your favorite companies that have pitched to you? Like, what are your favorite use cases that you're like, oh, yeah, that one would be good? There's something called geocaching. Um, it's a really interesting game in traditional Web2 world, right? Um, 
that you know people will put challenges out in public areas in these kind of like uh, container boxes, right? And there's a map where people can go see, hey, there's a challenge I can sol solve in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco or in Central Park in New York, right? Um, and they go, they open these boxes, they solve a puzzle, they write down the answer into the app, and it's kind of like a game in that respect, right? People, it's a two-sided marketplace. People can create the challenges or people can solve the challenges, right? right. If you think about disintermediating that, allowing like peer-to-peer -peer challenges to be created, some of my favorite use cases for Pebble Tracker have been around scavenger hunts in new countries, right? Imagine you're going to uh, Australia or New Zealand for the first time, right? Uh, when I did that, uh, before I started IOTEX, I was looking at all these different itineraries for like, hey, I have seven days on the South Island. I have 10 days on the South Island. I have two weeks. Uh, the itineraries are completely different, right? And what was really fascinating to me is like the itinerary creators, this is like the, this is the start of the creator economy, right? They are creating experiences for other people to experience. And it's not just like, hey, uh, I only have an itinerary for New Zealand. A lot of these people are global, right? Hey, if you go to Thailand, this is what I would do. This is what I would do if I was in this country, this country, this country, right? So they all, they have a fan base, like that really appreciate the itineraries. You can even create, the creator themselves can create a token, right? Prove to me you've completed my itinerary and I'm going to give you some rewards that maybe will unlock premium itineraries in the future or be redeemable for travel credits or things like this, right? So um, the proof, this is where machines come in, right? Not just any machine, but unbiased tamper-proof machines that do serve as real world data oracles, right? They tell the blockchain something about uh, a person or a, a thing and what they've done in the real world. And using that as the if statement, part of the if then uh, business logic, right? If I can prove something to the blockchain about what something I've done, whether it's run five miles or completed this itinerary, or lower my blood pressure from like a trusted wearable, then I can do any number of things, right? The then part is very expressive. I can mint NFTs, I can settle payments, I can send notifications, I can lower my insurance rates. That's what I'm um, thinking of. Yeah, I lower yeah. my blood pressure, I do such a good job, or my glucose levels get better, I'm no longer pre-diabetic, and my insurance company, maybe a blockchain-enabled insurance company would say, as we get this, we adjust your rate until you're as low okay. as we can get it because that's just, you're so much healthier, right? Yeah, it could even be real time, right? There's like a, everyone knows like the, the discount double check, Aaron Rodgers kind of like a all state insurance, you know, yeah. where if you don't get in an accident for an entire year, they're going to lower your insurance rate, right? But not getting into an accident doesn't really tell them that you're a good driver. Maybe you're just very lucky, right? Maybe you <laughs> drive so fast that everyone gets the hell out of the way, right? <laughs> Um, exactly. But if you have all this data from your vehicle, right, every vehicle has up to 20 plus electronic control units, everything from oh. is your seatbelt on to are your hands on the wheel to, you know, once we have cameras and dash cams that point inside and outside of the, the vehicle, these are all things, these are all data points that can tell your insurance company how well you drive and whether you're like driving under the speed limit or not, right? Um, or if you want to leave it opaque and be like, you know what, guys, um, thanks. Hitting an accident, that's enough. That's all you get to know. Keeping the rest yeah. of this, it's mine. Right, exactly. Those, that, that concept of owning the data from your vehicle, right? If you are at fault for an accident, you don't have to give up that information because you own it exclusively, right? There's no way the governance, government can subpoena the, uh, an organization that holds your data in their server because it's owned by you, right? It's owned right. by you, protected by the blockchain. So when you, go, when you get into an accident, right, if you have uh, signed unbiased videos from a trusted device that prove that you, my eyes are on the road, that this guy was swerving into my lane and I have it all in video, I have all the data of my vehicle of this snapshot in time, then what kind of, you know, what, what kind of legal proceedings need to be done? You know, there's no, uh, they don't need to deploy an auditor or like a, um, they don't have to go through this process to see who's at fault because, you know, I have the data and the, I can prove it to you, right? Right. So proof of safety or proof of um, this non, you know, uh, non-accident. I don't know. How to this almost that. means like that, you know, he or she with the most data wins. Yeah. Once we yeah. solve for who owns it, the person who has the most data about themselves at their disposal wins. Because if the guy that swerves into your lane doesn't have anything in his car and you yeah. have tons in your car you have all of the proof 
they yeah. can they can bitch them on all they want, but they actually there's nothing they can do. So then, yeah. if you have more data, you have more opportunity to prove or disprove what you want. Now, I guess that might be really interesting to see if there are pieces of data you would want to present and other pieces that you would not, and then it would become a part an issue of like either you give it all up or you don't. So if you don't yeah. you don't want to get a partial picture where you like manipulate the truth to mm -hmm. certain omissions. But that still is something that you can algorithmically sort of solve for, I imagine. Right, right. I mean, that's where the legal side of things comes into play. And that's yeah. one thing I'm very interested in is like in a court of law, how do you prove to someone that the video that I captured, you know, that has a cryptographic signature on it to prove the authenticity and the ownership of this video? I don't know if, you know, cryptographic proofs are going to fly in a court of law yet. Right. right? Um, but that's an interesting um, aspect of it. It's like, you know, how do we... How do we get this to be the standard that people trust, right? right. Um, but you know, I think that's exactly right. You know, we, we live in the information era already, right? There's a popular saying that data is the new gold or data is new oil, right? Yeah. If data is the new gold, then our machines and our devices are the gold mines, right? That like, is what kind true. of data do we write down ourselves, right? This well, is all being a data company you know? and being you know so so steeped in data on all on all sides. I have to wonder, um, and I think of digital gold, this whole Bitcoin thing. So like, do you have a coin? Are you are you focused on the coin? Has that made a big impact on just sort of like some of your business development decisions? Or are you really just like, yes, we do crypto, but we also just, we are working on strategic partnerships. We are just a real company. You can you know speculate on us all, all you want. We have a vehicle yeah. to do that. It's called the coin, but we're just gonna be doing this. Or have you just been like, you know, we're not even gonna bother tokenizing this. The data itself is its own token in a way. Yeah, you know, IOTEX itself is a vast ecosystem now. We're growing very fast. We have about 50,000 staking users, about 25 wow. dApps on the chain. And we're, you think about IOTEX as like layer one blockchain, right? We have our own token and the token is meant to maintain consensus and trust on this foundational platform of ours. And right? what is the token? It's called IOTX. IOTX. Yeah. And where could people find that token? Find it on Coinbase, Binance, Huobi, Everywhere except FTX, which is sad because I love FTX. Um, Me too. Oh, Actually, too. I interviewed FTX, uh, one of the founders, or one of the key people uh, yeah. for this podcast a couple of years ago. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully soon, you know, I'm a big fan of FTX. Um, but yeah, you know, um, IOTEX, you know, think about like what Ethereum does with their native token, right? It's meant yeah. to uh, establish incentives for validators to maintain consensus and it's meant to serve as a utility token for users, right? Same thing with IOTEX, right? We have our own platform. Uh, it's it built from scratch, no forks. But on top of this pl layer one platform, we have all these dApps oh, and wow. services and tools that have their own tokens that are yeah. meant to uh, drive incentives for usage of their specific applications, right? Everything from DeFi to GameFi to this new concept that we call MachineFi, right? Okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Tell me what MachineFi is. We might yeah. have some people know what DeFi is, decentralized finance, GameFi. Yeah. Okay, I get it. But MachineFi? Now that sounds really cybernetically, you know, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of metaphysical in a way, right? But, you know, DeFi is everything in crypto has a Fi element to it, right? Uh, blockchain itself is an amazing value transfer, value exchange mechanism, a great orchestration tool, right? But it's not, it's the, the predominant kind of like understanding of blockchain now is it's not really a great compute engine, right? right. Um, but for trust and for these kind of things, blockchains are very, very uh, solid in that respect, right? Um, so everything has a FI element, uh, even like gaming, right? Uh, now we're seeing a lot of financialization of gaming. You know, you do this in the game, you get that in, in your wallet, right? Um, machine FI is kind of how do we use the data and the services that machines can provide, right? Some, some machines like, Pebble Tracker are just bringing data to the blockchain, right? Other machines in the future starting to get a little, little fancy here, but you think about these autonomous devices and machines that are going to be popping up in the future. Everything from drones that are going to be monitoring our cities um, to taking like satellites that take aerial imagery to autonomous vehicles, to vending machines, to airport lockers, all these kind of unmanned autonomous machines, those Boston Dynamics robots, right? Um, who's going to own them? But machines are going to represent the entire workforce of the future. Who's going to own them? It's going to be a real big disaster if we get to the point five years down the road and we're like, oh, crap, all these autonomous machines, all the data is owned by AWS and Amazon and Google still like that's going to be a bad, you know, it's not going to be bad, but that massive gold mine of data 
is going to belong to big tech and the proceeds are going to continue not to be spread to users, right? See, so, but that's where if you use a cost-based economic model, you could end up incentivizing users to switch and do something different in the way, same way that people got disenchanted with WhatsApp and went to Signal. You yeah. know, it's when once people know for sure things are actually peer-to-peer, -peer, they're different, they're separate. And if there's an economic incentive there, the crowd will move where, where the money flows, right? I mean, even Malcolm yeah. X said that. He was like, if you really want to change things, you have to change the economics of it. You can't just True. hold your sign and protest about the moral plea. You have to make it more beneficial on it economically, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that movement is is definitely getting started. But, you know, speaking about the alternatives and, you know, I, th I think the, this whole concept of, you know, using your data for purposes outside of just, you know, as, as a metadata, you know, out of sight, out of mind type of thing. The, the concept of ownership of digital assets is still very confusing to people. I think NFTs yeah. are starting to get this into people's heads that, hey, this is exclusive. Only I own this, right? But it's, it's very understandable from like a non-fungible perspective. But when you think, think about data that's almost invisible, it's not represented as a JPEG. It's just ones and zeros. People but it is also non-fungible, right? It's also non-fungible, exactly. So there's so you're a living yeah. NFT, ultimately. If if you really think about this, you boil it down. Each person and owning their data without autonomy is a living non-fungible representation of, in, of data. 100%. Every device is going to be a, a non-fungible device as well, right? Right. Um, all these things that are being generated by humans and by devices if we can bring all of that understanding to the blockchain this is where these like if then statements come from right like all these smart contracts are are you know from basic to highly complex if then statements nested if then statements right if this thing happens then i'm going to do this and the good thing is because smart contracts are all open, it's all open source you know for a fact that if i do this it's going to do this and only this, right? The, the model we're living under today is if I do this and give this to Google, then I'm going to get this result. But there's also all these black box things that we know are happening, but we have no control to stop, right? So right. Uh, in the future, I think there's going to be primary, secondary, even like tertiary uses of our data, right? The Absolutely. data we can use to serve its primary purpose, right? Mm -hmm. If I share my GPS location, then I'm going to get this result, right? Then I'm going to, you know, be able to pay a toll or I'm going to be able to unlock some type of permission, right? The secondary use of data is how do I sell this data to earn value, right? If I am driving the same route every single day for a year to and from work, that data set is super, super valuable to the Ubers of the world, the yeah. DoorDashes of the world, even urban planners of the world, right? Oh, yeah. um, maybe it's not going to be worth thousands and thousands of dollars but it's going to be worth something right and that's a secondary usage of it you know well, could it also be that there's that there becomes a foundation where you can say i'm going to make a donation of this data and i'll be I'll, it, it has a monetary value just like if i donated yeah. my car i get 500 bucks at minimum right if i yeah. donate my data i can be incentivized by someone who wants to purchase it and then it becomes part of an open source kind of opportunity for others who in the same way that maybe uh what is it lexus nexus is like yeah the, uh, it's like a legal database that, that mm -hmm. lawyers can have exclusive access to because they pay every year. But yeah. it's all data. A tax break, if somebody wants to say, we'll make it open data. source, they make it open source. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's also tertiary and whatever the four <laughs> fourth <laughs> uses, I don't know what the terminology is, but those are still to be discovered, right? That's a really exciting part about yeah. all of this is like, once we get this data on chain, it's going to be really exciting to see what people come up with, right? Just like the scavenger hunt thing, just like... um you know, a lot of the, the primitives that DeFi in GameFi are showing us, right? Play to earn and like pooling together liquidity, um, you know, lending, borrowing, all of these things are, the subject is a token today, right? right? But a token is just a digital representation of value. Data is also a digital representation of value. So all of these primitives that are really booming in DeFi, like, you know, crowdsourcing liquidity for a DEX, and giving 0.3% of all transaction fees to liquidity providers. What if, you know, in the future, LexisNexis was decentralized? So everyone that's contributing to this legal database, anytime someone queries something within that database, then the proceeds are shared across the people that have crowdfunded this database, right? right. Um, and it's, maybe it's not even going to be 0.3%. You know, another example right. is like these Shutterstock or Getty Images, right? They aggregate all the stock imagery and they will take 30, 40% off of every sale, which is crazy, right? So it's starving the, 
photographers and the, the content creators, if you can decentralize that um, and even give like a group access to a repository of images, the more useful images you contribute to the repository, the more ownership you get of the future proceeds it's exactly like a DEX, right? Like a liquidity pool, except it is exactly like using exactly. different right. types of assets. You know, it's not just a direct representation of value in the form of a token. It could be kind of an indirect, like how much is this photograph worth? How much is this stock image worth? And we're talking about zero marginal cost products. You can sell these over and over and over and over. So um, it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, especially, you know, GameFi telling us doing things to serve the digital public good and earn digital reputation yeah you mentioned that it was yeah. called play to earn is one of those like catchphrases you threw out there and i was like oh user-centric yeah. play to earn that's yeah. really incredible there's even drive to earn or run to earn or live to earn right um there's yeah. a, a lot Smile of different to earn things. hug to earn love yeah, to earn exactly. yeah it just it's, it's that two-sided marketplace right on the demand side someone wants you to do something and they're going to pay you x amount to do it right on this side you have the uh, the chance to opt in to doing it. It's not a requirement, but if you decide to take this incentive and do what they say, it could be an insurance provider and an uh, insurance uh, customer. It can be a restaurant and their patrons. It could be right. any two-sided marketplace, right? You can start to really build these intensives and machines are the ones that are going to prove, you know, rather than having an intermediary that's human and error prone and manipulable in the middle, right? You can have an unbiased machine that proves that whatever this person is trying to incentivize you to do, you have done it. Um, that's a very clean peer-to-peer -peer, uh, type of contract, right? So sort of blockchain like the, is a big uh, part of it. Of machines are definitely a big part of it as well. Oh, huge. Absolutely. Sort of like the example of uh, having lots and lots of data of you driving your car and then yeah. someone swerving into your lane and they, they didn't happen to have that surveillance data in their car. So now you can prove what they did and they can't counter prove that you had negligence because your your proof happens to just like be the only proof available right so then yes. that she with the most data wins right mm -hmm. um as long mm -hmm. as she owns her own data yeah absolutely you know it's just a if you, like the the thing i love about crypto is like if you really think hard say like you were in a coma and you had amnesia you forgot everything right crypto is really about like it, with no understanding of how the the real world works like what if we had to redesign these things to be more fair right? This is how we would design it, right? So a lot of the, the change management, the conversion from web two to web three, it's going to be very interesting to see like which things uh, sprout up first. Like, of course, everything is economically driven in crypto right now. But, you know, I think even outside the US, people are starting to think about, okay, if my bank or my government can do this with my funds, then what can they do from a more like digital, uh, like, a, you know, China is a great example of this, right? Like all these machines tracking everything, right? The, the proof of walking across the crosswalk or proof of where you are during the day, there is already proofs of that everywhere, right? So uh, if you take that model and think about like that is what we could gravitate towards, not from like a government perspective, right. but more from like a corporation perspective, right? Do we want Amazon and Google and and Facebook knowing where we are at every single second, like that's what we're gravitating towards. Wouldn't you know? that be interesting if there was like a hack, oops, like a mm. hack of um, all that data in China, because they have just so much data, right? There was just a hack yeah. and basically it just, it was thrown on chain, has to catch up because it takes so much, so long to update that much, that much data. And then you come in and mm -hmm. you just validate with facial recognition, that's mine. And you just select your data back and you just get it back. Like what? That would be interesting. If, yeah. If Anonymous happened to be listening to this podcast and wanted a nice idea, I was just wondering what that might look like uh, if we were to see a massive, you know, anonymous recapturing of data, redistribution of it. I mean, I, I just, yeah. not that enough people would really know the power of getting on that one thing, but I can just see this eventually being the case. Like if, if the individuals who are hoping to, that are not happy with the way the system, the centralized system is, are able to see more and more opportunities to just to retweak it and use that one thing. It just seems like it's its own, we're living in very interesting times. By the end of our lifetimes, I think that we're gonna see this kind of empowerment take hold yeah. and have lots of opportunities for it to, to be seen and manifest in the world and lots and yeah. lots of places, whether it's legally, governmentally. Yeah, I think like one of the biggest opportunities, like everyone looks at like 
web or web two, right? The Google, Facebooks, Amazons of the world. Like there's this documentaries like the social dilemma. It really tells you, explains to you like how these businesses make money, right? These are advertising engines, right? They will grab all the data that we they have from all these apps that we do, and they'll make a guess, a very accurate guess about who is this person, what are they interested in. Sometimes it's scanning like what websites we visit. Sometimes it's just listening to us through our microphones, and you'll see it on your Instagram feed, right? right? Um, I was looking at, uh, you know, my my friend got dinner with Henry Golding's wife. Um, and I saw a post of that and I commented it on Instagram and I was watching YouTube on my TV and there's a, there is a, uh, an ad with Henry Golding in it. And I'm like, what the hell? Like I didn't type Henry Golding. Like this is his wife, but he know like there's yeah, some weird stuff saying. going on. Right. It's not just like, Hey, I talked about Lake Tahoe and then I see a Lake Tahoe ad, right. There's right. some, some very, very deep kind of like learning stuff going on there. Right. So, um, how do we flip that model around, right? Instead of having these big tech companies glean who we are based on these sketchy, like, you know, behind the scenes activities, what if we could prove to people who we are or tell people who we are, right? If we have our blockchain wallets and it tells someone all the smart contracts we've ever uh, engaged with or all the transactions we've ever made, right? If there is an advertising model, this is the two-sided marketplace. Right. This right? is where I choose how much of that I sell to you. You can sell to me as exactly. like a white woman, or you can sell to me as a white woman whose name is Monica, or you can sell yeah. to me and I can just check more and more and more boxes. And or then, you know, I've been to this campground you. or I've spent money on this flight on Travala, which takes crypto or, you know, these are all proofs of something, yeah. right? I prove that I'm a camper or I prove that I'm a traveler. Then advertisers without knowing your name or your demographic or whoever, they just know that you are a customer of their product can send you offers and discounts, right? So all of the money they're saving from playing this Google ads game, take that out and, you know, drive it towards creating more peer uh, customer relationships, right? And I think that is a, that's what's really starting to form uh, with these real world activities, right? Like it's going to be hard to say, Hey, I saw you traded a hundred million dollars on FTX over the weekend. Do you want to buy uh, a camera. It's like, no, nah, no, I, I, I'm, you know, there's not much like real world understanding yeah. you can glean from DeFi, but from GameFi and from MachineFi and all these other concepts where we're teaching the blockchain things about the people and the, the things that are going on in the world, you're going to really be able, be able to flip a lot of these models and disintermediate some of the biggest industries in the world, right? It's a really a trillion dollar opportunity, but it really so many is. pillars that need to be. Need that to is be a happening. huge opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, before I forget, I mean, we're just, there's so many rabbit holes we can continue to go down and, uh, yeah. well, we're going to have to have a part two on this. Once you, once you release it, the next uh, device or, you know, at some point in the future, we're going to mm -hmm. have to like bring you back on and do part two because this is so good. Um, but I do want to make sure I ask you a couple of fundamental questions that usually I try to ask people just because, you know, clearly you're brilliant. I mean, like, I don't think I'm saying anything surprising. And you, yeah. you know, clearly you've, you've really thought this through and you're doing really amazing work in the world, but that is not always just like the, it's not like that just abracadabra shows up. And I, I hesitate to shine people on and be like, look at how great they, okay, let's talk about it without putting some context. You know, like, where did you come from? How long were you confused about stuff before you were like, I'm doing that. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay. Like, you know, you got to start with, I used to give talks about like my artwork back when I was in, had a career in the arts years ago. And I would always try to pepper in paintings of mine that I hated. And I'd be like, I hate this painting. Here's why it never worked. It bothered me forever. And yeah. then I went somewhere else and it shows like, yeah, this is why I like the new stuff or this is why I can back mm -hmm. this up or this is why it has, has meaning to me. So yeah. not that I'm asking you to tell me like a time in your life you hated or stuff where you were lost, but can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what did you study in school? At what point did you kind of everybody kind of pivoted into this space because it's yeah. just too new. Nobody was born into it. So mm -hmm. how did you kind of find your way? Yeah, I was a lost soul for not lost. I would say uh, I was just uh, going with the flow for a long time, right? Welcome, um, you know, I grew nice up in LA. Life crisis in there. Perfect. <laughs> exactly. I grew up in LA, uh, had a very chill, relaxed childhood and uh, went to MIT and I studied econ and finance there. Um, and a little bit of visual arts and stuff. Um, huh. And I mean, throughout college, I tried a lot of different things. I thought, you know, um, I just kind of gravitated towards business a little bit. I know I didn't really want to do 
anything too deep in engineering. Um, but they say when you don't know what you want to do out of school, which I totally didn't, you know, I tried internships and trading and banking and, you know, yeah. uh, investment research. And I was like, okay, hey, I don't really like any of this stuff. Um, <laughs> they say, if you don't know what you want to do, you go into consulting. And that's what I did. I worked that's at, right. um, yeah, I worked at Oliver Wyman, uh, which is, uh, considered to be like a top five global consulting firm, uh, strategy side. And usually people do consulting for two years, two and out, right. They'll go to business school, uh, or they'll jump ship to a PE firm or something like that. I did consulting for five years, which okay. is also a signal that I had no idea what I wanted to do after that. I mean, I was climbing fast. I was good at the job. Right. Um, but five years is a long time, right. Um, through that journey, like consulting works in a way where you're promoted almost every one or two years into more senior roles. So I got to see that entire stack, right? All the way from the entry level consultant doing the nitty gritty formulas in those Excel spreadsheets, writing docs, writing PowerPoints, all the way to the point where I was managing kind of larger teams, um, all the way down the funnel, coordinating with the partners that lead the project, right? So amazing first job. I would consider it to be like a grad school for real business, which is great. But at the end of the day, you know, consulting, that's a tough lifestyle, right? I wasn't 21 anymore. I was 25, 26. Um, it doesn't sound too old, but like being on flights every single week for four or five years will take its toll eventually. Um, so, you know, during, during some of my last two projects is when I started to hear more about Bitcoin, right? We did a project for the World Economic Forum on oh, the future cool. of payments. And, and what year was that? That was around 2015. Okay. Um, it was actually commissioned by the Queen of the the, the Netherlands or something like that. Oh wow! Um, and it was presented to at the Davos summit. Um, yep. And Familiar. one of the one of the topics we touched on, you know, including like mobile payments with M-Pesa in Kenya and like you know uh, cross border remittances, Bitcoin was just starting to come into the fold there, right? So that's the first time I heard about Bitcoin. I thought it was really interesting. But it was at a point when no one understood or even believed in that technology, right? So that's the first time I heard about it. I was like, okay, uh, this is really interesting. I started to read more about it. It was around the time of the ETH ICO. I didn't participate, but I wish I did, of course. <laughs> um, but the last project I did was really the one that was like, okay, this stuff has some value, not from the crypto perspective, from a blockchain perspective, right? I worked at this company called the OCC, or I was consulting for the OCC. It's called the Options Clearing Corporation they clear and settle pretty much 98% of all derivatives contracts in the United States. It's a nonprofit owned by a bunch of these banks running dinosaur technology. And basically what they do is they just aggregate information from all these exchanges, clear and settle these transactions. And that, that's their service, right? Um, it's very easy to encode this. And we actually pitch them, hey, you should think about a blockchain based system is basically like a buy versus build assessment for them, right? Um, you should consider this blockchain based system and pretty much like, you know, build your way, uh, decentralize your way out of this, right? It yeah. could be owned and it was still a little too early to even consider these things. But that's really when um, the intersection of like my tiredness from consulting and my interest in blockchain um, kind of uh, merged. And then that's when I decided to jump ship over to IOTEX. And, it's been four years now um, of crypto rabbit holeness, and you know, it's it's been <laughs> yeah. really fun. You know, I mean, and much uh, more engaging than having like a million different projects and consulting too, right? Isn't it? Yeah. I'm amazed that there is so there's always more to get out of the blockchain space in general. You start blockchain, and then crypto, DeFi, you're all the way to like machine fi, and like it's going to yeah. be like spiritify pretty soon. I mean, it's, it just keeps yeah. going. So I have yeah. not been bored for a second since I moved into this space, and. Sounds exactly. like even though you usually have an expiration date of like four or five years, five or six years, I don't think you're going anywhere either. You're stuck. You drank the Kool-Aid. I'm pretty stuck. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, think I, I feel very lucky to have been given the opportunities I had in consulting, right? Like um, there's a lot of different practices within these consulting firms, things that are doing things related to financial risk or, you know, e-commerce strategy or like these things. I was in the digital group and this was at a time when, you know, cloud infrastructure wasn't really like what it was today. So yeah. a lot of the projects we were doing, we're like, okay, how do we move these big ass companies from on-premises data centers to over yeah. to the cloud? And, you know, in 2015 and 2016, this was like pulling teeth, right? Yeah. Because no one was confident about the cloud. It was only until FINRA, who's a government entity, decided to put their data on the cloud. And they're like, everybody okay, can do it. Right. We're good now, right? So 
crypto well, is going to then we can do it because if FINRA does it, we're not going to get audited and they go, what do you mean? You know, I mean, okay. it's always this, this chicken and egg thing with them. Like they, they determine so much more than they should because they're so far yeah. behind the curve so often. Yeah, FINRA, exactly. I, I'm looking at you, but you know, but at the <laughs> same time, they, because crypto, of the powers right? to be, like you have, have to make sure you don't do something that goes counter to what their intuition says, because they could just turn around and make your life a living hell. Yeah, absolutely. You know, crypto is waiting for that moment, right? You see a lot of big yeah. companies like Visa settling contracts on Ethereum. But once a government entity uses blockchain for something, CBDC may be that, but it's not really the decentralized version of crypto, but it's a start, right? Yeah. I think that's going to give people the green light to really start looking into this a little bit more, right? But, you know, at Oliver Wyman, I was really sitting at the intersection of tech, business, and uh, operations, right? And sitting in between that, I think really, really helped me out in crypto because I spoke the languages of multiple groups, right? I'm not a dev, but I can chat and understand the concepts around why these things happen. And that's just because I've written requirements documents that have been like 80 pages long. I know like what these systems were meant to do and what they can do, right? right. Um, I'm not going to build them myself, but I, from a high level perspective, and that's really what I think helps me in crypto is like, okay, this system is meant to do that for this business purpose. And this is how the, the, the uh, governance and the operations that connect all these things happen together, right? So um, yeah, it's been a journey, but I think, you know, we're just getting started. I'm, I'm really interested in how all these different primitives are going to intersect between NFT, Absolutely. DAOs, DeFi, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's such a, it's a, it's an insane time. I mean, it's such a, just the DeFi world itself right now, you know, we're going to be this is, I think, published, you know, early, or, I'm sorry, late 2021 is when we're, we're scheduling this one to go out. And it's just mm -hmm. like crazy time. Oh my God. But, you know, it comes and goes. As long as you've been around for long enough, you're there for the 2017 craze. You know how it yeah. goes. You know, have the next one, we're in a craze now. It's going to be getting worse, worse meaning better. And it's going to, you know, yeah. drop off another crypto winter is going to come. And, but it's nice now to feel like, oh, this is the cadence at which we breathe. Okay. I get it. You know, yeah. their market's yeah. going to be okay. It's not that's that out of the bag. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if so we bad. had this conversation, if, if we had this conversation one year ago, I think there would still be some doubt whether, you know, blockchain and crypto would, would survive, right? Now that DeFi is here, now that NFTs are here, um, these are movements now and yeah. cats out of yeah. the back, right? There's no going back now. It's only like, it's not a matter of if, it's kind of when, right? What's yeah. the next thing going to be? Um, and I think that whether it's next quarter, next year, or, hopefully not the following year, but IOT and smart devices and real world data, you see a lot of people starting to talk about it, but it hasn't reached fandom. No, yet. it is not. It has not very... actually reached a conversation, which is why I think it's so yeah. important that you, that you get this kind of, you know, that you get as much exposure around real world objects that are there on Amazon. If you want to do this, try yeah. this thing, it will walk you through it. So get on Amazon and check this, these products out. There aren't a lot of them out there yet. They will be picking yep. up. There's going to be more and IOTEX is definitely leading the charge. It's pretty yeah. incredible. And if you're a you know, crypto investor, you should check out the, the token. I'm not, this is not financial advice, but you know, mm -hmm. when you learn about a company and you really want to remember that company or keep a finger on that pulse, you know, one way is to buy a teeny tiny bit of their coin because it's like putting your psychological skin in the game, you know? Yeah. And I always think like, I just have to, I have to at least like give myself a bookmark to always be watching that. And so it's always like, ah, get, get a token here or there or something like that, because it does yeah. keep me going. I'm, I'm invested. Even if it's like five bucks, I'm invested, I'm invested, you know, yeah. I'm invested in what's going to happen. And I can now have a reason to watch it rather than I'm just consuming information. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. It's like an active yeah. source of information that is you can actionable as well. So I hope the listeners check out your products and really get a sense of what you're bringing to the market and have, if they have any questions, we're going to have all of your information in the, in the notes and people can definitely dive into your iotex.io website and learn more and more mm -hmm. about what you're doing. This is just like, it's a very exciting time. And especially bringing hardware and IOT to this space is, is really commendable. It's a heavy lift to be doing manufacturing as well as all yeah. of the abstracting of a blockchain, but I just, I love the work you guys are doing and I'm so glad we could bring you onto the show. Thank you yeah. so much, Larry. It's been a total pleasure. Yeah, I had a great time. You know, if anything we chatted about piques the interest of any listeners, you know, feel free to reach out. Always good to chat, you know, whatever crazy use cases you have or, you know, very immediate um, impactful use cases that we could start using today. You know, yeah. IOTEX is permissionless, you know, it's an open network, global community. So 
all are welcome. So I'm happy to chat with anyone, but really appreciate you having me on, Monica. We'll definitely do it again soon. Yes, definitely. We're going to have to do a part two at some point soon. Um, thank you so much, Larry. And again, I'm here with Larry Pang, head of business development and founding member of IOTEX, a wonderful IoT company bringing the best of blockchain to actual wearable and usable devices. Totally brilliant. Check it out. And this is Monica Profit wrapping up yet another episode of the new trust economy. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks a lot, you guys. Bye bye. You've been listening to the new trust economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.